Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, How to Interpret Scripture. Now that should be a challenge. And this is lesson number six in that series for May 9 of 2020, entitled, Why is Interpretation Needed? Maybe we don't need it. Well, we'll find out. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we come now recognizing your presence with us and our, our desperate need for the guidance of your Holy Spirit to understand every part of Scripture and how they fit together. May this lesson help us to come closer to that goal is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, just to hit the nail right on the head to begin with, to read the Bible also means to interpret the Bible. When you read it, you are producing a kind of understanding in your brain that's an interpretation. It's not going to be the same for everybody. What do we mean by that? There are many different types of stories, miracles, parables, even prophecies in Scripture, each of which needs to be understood in light of its context. There are many ways in, th in which the Bible can be misused. Dennis, I think you have yes, something about that. Uh, this is from the uh, Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for May 2nd. Um, for instance, when a husband left his wife for another woman, the wife got great assurance when she found the following text. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, <laughs> Genesis 3.15. She was convinced, based on that verse, that her husband's affair would not last. Okay. Is that a proper use of scripture? <laughs> no. It's no. Shaky. No. And I heard this um, a preacher when I was very young talking about uh, somebody. He was listening to a preacher on the radio, and and the the fashion was beehive hair oh, yeah. haircuts. You've probably heard this because yeah. it probably went around, but he. Uh, uh, the, the message was, top knot come down, uh -huh. top knot come down, you know. So he was railing against beehive air, <laughs> air cuts, so. Styles. Uh, right, so, uh, so this other guy telling the story looked and looked in Scripture until finally he found where the passage was, and it's, let he who is Matthew not. Matthew 24. Yeah, he, let he who is on the house top not come down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's another story that only people in America would understand about a guy who was in desperate shape financially, and he went to his pastor, and the pastor says, well, get out your Bible, read the Bible, God will give you some guidance. And the guy stopped coming, from, coming to church and didn't see him for a while, and then the pastor met him on the street and had loose smiles and so forth, and uh, he said, well, what happened? Oh, he says, I followed your advice. Well, what did you do? He says, I looked up in my Bible. I closed my eyes. I opened the Bible, and I put my finger down, and it said, Chapter 7. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we here in this country know that Chapter 7 is a, is a code for bankruptcy. So, <laughs> <laughs> gives you a fresh start. Yeah. Gives you a fresh start. Yeah. Or the guy who did that, and it was... and, and um, so-and-so went out and hanged himself. Oh. And he didn't like that, so he tried another one, and it was, go, go oh, thou and do likewise. likewise. <laughs> <laughs> we know who is, that, it's almost like a Ouija board. Yeah, we know exactly. who controls that. So. Yeah. so any text read or quoted without a context quickly becomes a pretext for one's own agendas, agenda and ideas. So if you grab a piece and you find three or four words, that you like, and then you start adding your ideas, whose who's thing are you quoting? You're not quoting scripture anymore. It is very easy to take a portion of a text or just a part of a story and interpret it in your own ways, coming up with your own conclusions, often in complete contrast to what the biblical context and history suggests. Guess who would love to suggest ideas of his own to misinterpret scripture? The devil did it even to Jesus in the temptations in the wilderness, and he will certainly do it to us if we allow it. 
So what factors normally affect us as we open our Bibles and begin to read? One of the largest factors is presuppositions. What is a presupposition? Ideas that we, may, that we have that may be correct or totally in error, but which we believe to be true and which influence how we interpret what we read. The story of how the Pharisees and Sadducees misunderstood Jesus is an excellent example. The disciples themselves had very clear ideas, which they had learned from the Sadducees and the Pharisees, about what they believed the Messiah was supposed to do, and they just couldn't understand why Jesus didn't get on with the business. And they could not even consider the possibility that he would die a traitor's death on a cross. And on that journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem, the very last time we have some words from Jesus. Luke 18, mm -hmm. 31 to 34. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Are there any words in that that are like five syllables long, hard to understand? No. 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 Those are you simple. You wonder what they thought when they heard that. Where was their mind? Yeah, well, exactly. It they, be more simple. They could not imagine that they had other just, ideas. No, and, and that I mean, was just... They were, with this, they were in this great crowd going up the road, and everybody in that crowd believed that they were escorting Jesus to be anointed king. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and so when he said that, that was just, just went right over their heads. They just... Yeah. Well, Jackie will tell us what it says. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Amazing. Amazing. This wasn't the first. This is the fourth time that Jesus has talked, yeah. that we have recorded. We don't know how many other times there were. The fourth time we have recorded that Jesus talked to them about it. Well, each one of us, so let's be honest here, we have to for these really foundational ideas. Each one of us has a worldview or sometimes called a paradigm, uh, which is a set of beliefs which he or she is very comfortable with and into which he or she will always try to fit any new idea. If a new idea does not fit, often that new idea will be ignored or rejected. We have, we have words for that. It flew right past their head or it went in one ear and out the other. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. There are many biblical critics who philosophically reject the idea that God can predict the future or that it can work supernatural miracles. If one takes that approach, then there will be, a large, there will be large portions of Scripture that she or he will reject out of hand. In fact, when studying new ideas, it is almost always harder to set aside the old ideas that, we, that may conflict with new ones than it is to accept totally new ideas. Old concepts and beliefs are very difficult to change. I would say some things about older people, but I've already got gray hair, so I better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Christians, however, have a secret weapon. The Holy Spirit can help us to open up and correct our limited preset, preset pers perspectives and presuppositions. And where... What do we read about that? John 16, 13 from the Good News Bible. When however, the, <clears throat> when, however, the Spirit comes who reveals the truth about God, He will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but He will speak of what He hears and will tell you of things to come. Wow. So there it is. Future things, things about God. Are there certain concepts that you hold that make it very difficult for you to accept some of the teachings of the Scripture? I'm asking you out there. It is well known that the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek, which was a common Greek in the time of Paul and the other apostles. This was the, I mean, this is the, the Greek you would use when you went to buy potatoes in the market. This, was, this is not some exotic language just for the Bible to be written in. This was the common language that people spoke, the lingua franca, we sometimes call it. 
Very few people, in fact, are able to read these ancient languages today. Even modern Greek is considerably different from the Koine Greek of the Bible. As we know, any language that people use daily changes over time. Greek is no different, nor is Hebrew or Aramaic. I, every time I read this statement like that, I have to smile because I was studying theology when I was in college. And I studied the first year, I mean, it was try to learn all the basic concepts of, of Greek was a real challenge. It was a, it was a struggle, but I did it. And then I, 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 I decided I wanted to get ahead because I, I wanted to take all the classes in Greek that were available. So I, so I did the second year Greek in, um, in a summer course by, by correspondence. That was a real diller. Mm -hmm. But I got through it. And then next year when I came from my third year of Greek, in our class was a lady from Greece. Oh. And I thought, oh boy, you know, she's going to completely just screw up the curve or whatever. I mean, none of us. Can. Well, it turns out she kept messing up because she kept mixing, mixing up her modern Greek with the biblical Greek we were studying. Mm -hmm. I got a better grade in the class than she did. Not because I was it didn't any help expert. to know Greek. <laughs> what? It didn't help to know modern Greek. Huh. Well, any good translator knows that no matter what the two languages are that she or he is dealing with, translating from one language to another requires interpretation. In fact, every language has some words in it that no other language exactly matches. My wife and I have had the privilege of living in several different parts of the world, and we picked up a few words from Swahili, a few words from uh, other languages, places where we lived, that there's nothing that's just quite like that. So every once in a while, you, you'll hear us throwing in a Swahili word because it fits that situation. So I know exactly what it's talking yeah. about here. So interpreters or translators must struggle to present the ideas that are presented in one language as clearly as possible in the second language. That skill is called Hermeneutic. hermeneutics. Well, Read 1 Corinthians 12, 10, 14, 26, John 1, 41, 9, 7, and Acts 9, 36, and finally Luke 24, 7. These passages, if we had time to read them, uh, make it very clear that when translating from one language to another, skill is needed. In fact, Luke 24, 7, who's doing the translating? Jesus himself. He's speaking to those two men on the road to Emmaus. Um, he has to make the Old Testament clear to some of his extended disciples, even though they spoke Aramaic and presumably Hebrew. So even, even when you know the language, it's very easy to misunderstand if you have your preconceived ideas. Carrie, I think you got something on that. Yes. The Greek word hermenuo, from which we have the word hermeneutics, which means biblical interpretation, is derived from the Greek god Hermes. Hermes was considered to be an emissary and messenger of the gods, and as such was responsible for, among other things, translating divine messages for the people. Wow. From our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. So that's where that came from, huh? But there's an extra challenge in translating passages from Scripture. We not only expect people to get the correct wording and idea across, but also we expect them to change their lives in accordance with what they have learned. Well, that's a, that's a real dealer. Well, yeah. We can't always expect others to do yeah. what probably we aren't even willing to do ourselves. You didn't have to be quite so blunt. <laughs> <laughs> Many languages have multiple translations of the Bible, but there are still a number of groups in our world who do not have even a small part of the Bible in their language. Um, there, it is estimated that there are still 5% of the world population that do not have even any, a single portion of Scripture in their language. And there are groups, the Wycliffe Bible Translators and some of the Bible societies are trying to reach these, these groups. There's some pretty sizable groups of people that there's some some believe it or not some language some languages in the world that have not yet been turned into a written language right really just or mm -hmm. tribes even so that they have the spoken language yeah. and, but there are people trying to help them yeah some of them 
there was two brothers who just did that came out and got educated outside and went back and said we have to make our language uh, written and they had a they had a really great inside inside and they managed to turn their their language they, they produced a written form for their language yeah. and many years ago we had a special on a weekend with two like Wycliffe Bible translators that were here in Loma Linda uh -huh. and gave several talks. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was so fascinating that yeah. there were languages that have yet to even been have somebody they're, write them down. They're very active at the present time. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're so worried about it, they are not always doing complete copies of the Bible. They're giving them four or five books to keep them yeah. busy while they're trying to translate more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a real mission. Yeah. It is, really. So how should we deal with multiple translations if we have them in our own language? There are probably more than a thousand different translations of at least a portion of the scriptures in English. How do we choose the right ones to read and study? Well, no matter what translation we choose to read, we will need the Holy Spirit to guide us in our understanding of what we are reading. Amen. And as we read last week in Acts 17, uh, we know the experience of Paul there in Athens. He, he did a great job, but he wasn't able to convince too many people. Well, Paul, there never was a church in Athens that we, in the Bible it talks about the churches in different places, oh. but there was not one in Athens. No. That we know of. Yeah. That we know of, yeah. Paul had been chased from city to city in Macedonia, and he was trying briefly to spread the good news in each city. Finally, he was forced to flee and ended up in Athens. He walked around Athens for a few days and realized how many idols and false forms of worship they had. So he began to talk to them about a better kind of religion. He praised them for being very religious. The longest word in the New Testament, they see diamond asteros, very religious. But then he pointed out the problems with their religions. Fortunately, a few were con convinced, but most of them were not. This illustrates the fact that a knowledge of Mediterranean culture is very important for understanding some biblical passages. Okay, for example, Hebrew culture attributed responsibility to an individual for acts he did not commit, but that he allowed to happen. Therefore, the inspired writers of the scriptures commonly credit God with doing actively that which in Western thought he would say he permits or does not prevent from happening. For example, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. This is Methods of Bible Study, Section 4, Paragraph 3 at the Adventist Biblical Research, Research Organization. ORG. Yeah, and you can get that material if you want to use it for your Sabbath school class <laughs> by going to our website. It's theox dot org. And you'll find it, I think, as interesting as we have found it. But that's very a very key part that a point that you just made there. Uh, that that's a belief. That's the thing. If God is all powerful and He doesn't prevent something, that's in their minds is the same as He's causing it. He's He's doing it. I mean, well, I mean, if God is all powerful, He the point would be. If God is all-powerful, then if he didn't want it to happen, he could have stopped it. Yeah. yeah but in love permits yeah. you to do well, self-destructive things. You, yeah, I mean, he, in Genesis 1, two places uh, give you dominion. Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he gave dominion to the human race and didn't uh, say, well, but I'm going to micromanage your, your, your lives. Yeah. It's not there. Yeah. Some biblical critics try to dismiss the Bible, claiming that it was applicable only to the people who lived back in the days when it was written. That could be a real problem. Some want to translate scripture based on their own cultural ideas, but the salvation which Jesus offered is certainly not limited to one time or to one group of people. I certainly am thankful for that. And trying to make his speech relevant to the Greek intelligentsia, Paul pointed out that his religion recognized that all people came originally from a single couple, Adam and Eve. Thus, we are all really all members of a large family, and God is the creator of all. Salvation can appeal to any person in any culture at any time if we allow it to do so. Jim? 
And if we use that for the word salvation, we could say healing. Yeah. Uh, the per person's happy where they're at. Why would they want to change? Yeah. As a parallel, think about algebra, which was first invented in the 9th century A.D. in Baghdad. Does this mean then that the truths and principles of this branch of mathematics are limited only to that time and place? Of course not. That's Bible right. Study Guide, Tuesday, May 5th. Yeah. It is true that understanding some of the ancient Mediterranean cultures and ideas helps us to interpret Scripture. There's no question about that. This does not mean that the Bible is applicable only to people who lived in those days, because we can, we can learn about those things. Um, I'm going to read a passage here, John 9, 39 to 41. Jesus said, I came to this world to judge so that the blind should see and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, surely you don't mean that we are blind too? And Jesus answered, if you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you see, this means that you are still guilty. Wow. Many of us think that we have carefully thought through our own ideas and beliefs. We feel that we have an open mind and can faithfully or fairly evaluate any new idea that comes along. But we need to remember that sin has radically altered, ruptured, and fractured our relationship with God. Sin and its corruption can be detected in our thinking. Some examples, pride, self-deception, doubt, distance, disobedience are often the result. And people can be incredibly good at self-deception, just incredibly good. For example, a proud person might decide that he or she is capable of judging Scripture for himself or herself, thus elevating his or her human reason above Scripture. They may listen only to ideas that are attractive to them even if they are directly in contradiction with ideas from the Bible. Unfortunately, Revelation 3 makes it clear that at the end of this world's history, a group of people who claim to be Christians will have a very erroneous idea of their condition. Do I dare to read it? Revelation 3:17. You say, I am rich and well off. I have all I need. But you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. You are poor and naked and blind. Wow. That couldn't describe us, of course, right? We wouldn't be Laodiceans, right? If we take the approach that it is our job to judge Scripture, we will never come up with the right yeah. conclusions. Can you think of a time when you found yourself fighting against conviction based on something you read in the Bible? No. I'll leave that question for you out there to think about. Our lesson is entitled, Why is Interpretation Needed? An excellent example that gives a partial answer to that question is found in Nehemiah 8, 1 to 3 and verse 8. Dennis? By the seventh month, the people of Israel were all settled in their towns. On the first day of that month, they all assembled in Jerusalem in the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the priest and scholar of the law which the Lord had uh, given to Israel through Moses to get the book of the law. So Ezra brought it to the place where the people had gathered, men, women, and the children who were old enough to understand. Now I want to interrupt there for just a second. We talked about this a couple of quarters back when we studied Ezra and Nehemiah in our Sabbath school lessons. Notice who was there. Men, women, and children. children were old enough to understand. What is the specific purpose of this gathering? To hear the law. Yeah, to understand, and to understand it. Understand it. The point is, we're not here just to read. Just you know, like in the old days when the Latin, when the Roman Catholics would sit there and read passages from in Latin, and nobody has a clue what they're reading. But we're reading it. No, this is a group gathered to get understanding. Okay, go ahead. And uh, he would be reading from Hebrew. Yes. And they would pre pretty much understand Aramaic. Well, so go ahead. We're going to read. So we're, we'll see why they had to, yeah. There in the square by the gate, he read the law to them from dawn until noon. And they all listened, all, 
attentively. Uh, we skipped over three or four verses in there. What it says in those three or four verses that he had 13 people on each side of him, probably speaking to a huge crowd out, and they were hearing his reading in Hebrew, and they were translating into Aramaic. And what was the result? Go ahead. They understood. They gave an oral translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand it. And it had a marvelous impact on them. Imagine, for the first time, someone's actually giving you the Bible in your language. This was the first, what we would call, modern language translation of scriptures that we know about. That Notice that lasted several hours, didn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. all morning so, long. And it says they were attentive. Yes, absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. If our salvation is dependent upon a correct understanding of Scripture and thus a correct understanding of God, what else could be as important as, as that? And again, there's a verse for that, Matthew 16, 26. Will people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. There is nothing they can give to regain their life. For Seventh-day Adventists who have already claimed that they believe in the Bible, the most important question in the great controversy, the theme behind most of Scripture is, can God be trusted? Because Satan says, no, he can't. It might seem impossible, but even in the early church, in the days when Peter and Paul were still active, errors apparently were creeping into the church already. Jackie, I think you get Second Peter again. Yeah, Second Peter 3, 15 and 16. Look on our Lord's patience as the opportunity he is giving you to be saved, just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you, using the wisdom that God gave him. This is what he says in all his letters when he writes on the subject. There are some difficult things in his letters which ignorant and unstable people explain falsely, as they do with other passages of the Scripture. Now, so they bring on their own destruction. Yeah. I want to bring out two things that's really important in that passage that make me, always make me smile when I read it. Our dear brother Paul. <laughs> <laughs> does, does that remind you of anything? Oh. Over in Galatians, well, Paul came Paul along and said, rebuked him. he yeah. rebuked him in public. Yeah. Mm. Rebuked Peter, Peter. And now, a long time later, it's possible yeah. these two guys were in the Mamertine prison together at the same mm. time, waiting to be killed, to be martyred. And, Paul, and Peter says, what? Our, Our dear, dear brother Father. Paul. That's the first thing. No, he didn't hold it against him. No. no. And notice who it is that misunderstands the Scripture? Unstable. Ignorant and unstable people. Unstable thinkers. Yeah. It's very interesting to note that Peter, who may have been in the Mamertine prison in Rome along with Paul when he wrote or dictated Second Peter, already considered Paul's writings as Scripture. Notice, as with other passages of the Scriptures. Why do you think that was? Or when Peter used the term scripture, did that mean only writings which may or may not have been inspired? No, Peter was talking about inspired records. If we, by the way, how would you, what would it be like to be in prison in the same room with, with Paul? Well, they probably have, have a about? lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah. It would be a lot easier than being in solitary confinement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would... You, about all you, about I think all I would have time to do is ask some questions. Talk, Paul, keep talking. I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Poor guy's not going to get any rest when he gets to heaven. Well, so many, Paul would have questions of Peter, too, who yeah. had spent three and a half years with Jesus. Yeah. 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 If we, Seventh day Adventists, are going to claim the Bible and the Bible alone as our source of truth, rejecting false tradition, creeds, or human authorities, then we must develop a very careful and reliable hermeneutic. What does hermeneutic mean again? Interpretation. interpretation. Okay, of the scripture. Without a correct interpretation of the Bible, there could be no unity of doctrine or teaching the church would lose direction, a bad and distorted theology would result. Seventh-day Adventists have claimed for many years that our job is to present the three angels' messages found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12 to the world. So we're all out at least a couple days a week 
standing on the corner explaining Revelation 14, 6 to 12, right? Uh, we don't even talk about it in church. Not very often. No, we really don't. Do we have a clear understanding of how to interpret those verses so that they are un understandable to your neighbors? Those are some of the verses that we might somehow wish that yeah. they were a little different than what they are. Look at a couple of examples. You know what talks about the fires of hell and God's wrath and all that kind of stuff. Look at a couple of examples that might impact how we are to interpret those keywords in Revelation 14. What is the wrath of God? Well, there's a handout on our website if you want to look it up. Talks about God's wrath starting from Judges, right? In fact, starting in Numbers, if you will, all the way through the Bible. The wrath of God is his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious and destructive choices. Jim, there it is. God has to do things, not because he wants to, but because he refuses to violate our freedom and you know, so forth. And what about the fires described in the third angel's message? This is from Desire of Ages 107. To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. So notice that. Is, who's who's, who's going to get the, their sins consumed? All of us. Not all everybody. All who submit, all who submit to this power. All who submit to his power. In other words, yeah. there's two possibilities here. We're going to get, get the next quotation in just a moment. But the first possibility is we can submit to the Holy Spirit's power, and he will consume sin from our lives, okay? That's one side. Go ahead, Jim. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. That's, okay. that's the quote, actually, 107. Yeah. That first one, our God is a consuming fire, was Hebrews yeah. 12. The glory of his countenance, which is the righteous, to, to the righteous is life, will be to the wicked a consuming fire. Because of love rejected, grace despised, the sinner will be destroyed. Okay. I'd, I'd kind of like to tie those two together with the wrath of God, of God pulling away, because mm -hmm. um, if he remained, no one can see God and live. And our purpose of... of uh, Coming to know God is to come closer and closer to Him, mm -hmm. uh, and through the power of the Spirit, uh, the resistance of our will gets broken down, and we begin to uh, see Him more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, if if somebody is resisting God, two things are possible: either God comes closer and they're destroyed, or He pulls back to give them more time to to change, oh, or, or I, yeah. more time to to take a different approach. The point is that God's glory will eventually get poured out on this earth. To some people, the righteous, it will give them eternal life. To the wicked, it will consume them. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a different glory. It's not God saying, I don't like you, but I like you. No, it's God's glory pours out, and if we're, if we're out of harmony with it, we, we get consumed. If we're in harmony with it, it's fine. Might think of it like plugging a 110 yeah. toaster into a 210 socket. Not that yeah. you could do that because <laughs> yeah. it's a different plug, but uh, you, you would just be overloaded and that destroys you. So now the challenge is how do we manage to set aside our preconceived ideas and accept the teachings of Scripture? Gary? In your study of the Word, lay at the door of investigation your preconceived opinions and your hereditary and cultivated ideas. You will never reach the truth if you study the Scriptures to vindicate your own ideas. Wow. Leave these at the door and with a contrite heart go in to hear what the Lord has to say to you. As the humble seeker for truth sits at Christ's feet, and learns of him, the word gives him understanding. 
to those who are too wise in their own conceit to study the Bible, Christ says you must become meek and lowly in heart if you desire to become wise unto salvation. Do not read the word in the light of former opinions, but with a mind free from prejudice, search it carefully and prayerfully. If, as you read, conviction comes and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Make your opinions fit the word. Wow. Do not allow what you have believed or practiced in the past to control your understanding. Open the eyes of your mind to behold wondrous things out of the law. Find out what is written and then plant your feet on the eternal rock. That's from Youth Instructor, July 24, 1902. Okay, so Youth Instructor was written to who? The young people. The young people. Yes. Isn't, wow. Isn't it interesting to think of the little phrase, the eyes of your mind? Mm hmm That's how the blind see. Yep. Yep. I've mentioned this before, but it was several lessons back, but conservative talk show host Dennis Prager talks in or writes in his commentary on Genesis that he was debating a secular Jew mm -hmm. about the Torah and um, he summarized their differences and the other guy agreed that when the secular Jew comes to the Torah and he disagrees with something, he thinks he's right and the Torah is wrong. Whereas Dennis said that when I come to the Torah and I disagree with it, I think the Torah is right and I am wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And that's, that's exactly what she's telling us to do right, right. here. Right, that's kind of what triggered it. In and it's, 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 it's interesting that this is written to the young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was intended for young people. Does that mean I can use it? Hmm. Sure. Well, <laughs> you were once young. <laughs> Compared you, to the antediluvians, you know you're young. about a hundred. You're really still. <laughs> you're really still <laughs> young. Do you have a clear understanding about how sin has impacted our interpretation of Scripture? What has happened to us since the days of Adam and Eve, when they walked with God in the garden in the cool of the evening? What makes it impossible for us to even see God without being destroyed? Moses, I mean, clear back there. I mean, look how much further we are away from, from the Garden of Eden than he was. But Moses, way back there, God says, no, you can't see me. I'll put you in this little, well, I don't know, come crevice, crevice or something in the rock there, and I'll pass by and you can see my backside. Well, I'm sure it wasn't, okay, you can see my backside. What, what does that mean? He, obviously, he was saying, you can see a part of me, you can see... You can see you can, him walking away, he you, maybe had a robe on, and or something just like that. Yeah. Walking. Obviously, you can't see all of me. I can't see his face. Wow. Well, well but, his face shone when yeah. he came down. So, yeah. so there's something about the presence that is just lit up. Yeah. Uh, and he, it could have burned his eyes, possibly, or something, yeah. if he yeah. saw yeah. him fully. Jesus, well, Jesus uh, said of the little ones that they're angels do continually behold the face of the Father, mm -hmm. which is in heaven, which yeah. I think is the condition of the unfallen. Uh, they can behold the face of the Father. When we fell, we could no longer behold him and live. You remember there, like Jackie's already pointed out, at the end of Exodus, Moses came, Moses came down from the mountain after that second period of 40 days, and his face was shining. He had to wear a veil. Mm -hmm. He had to wear a veil. Now, I don't know, you know, does God's glory shine through a veil, <laughs> a veil or not? I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to describe this. What do you do with John 118 and 646 when Jesus says, nobody has seen the Father except for the one that came from the Father? Yeah. Implies that uh, nobody's ever seen the Father. This yeah. is part of our discussion this afternoon with his friend, hour and 20 minutes. We talk spiritual things. Do the angels even see a form that looks like us that's the Father? Or probably, do they just see glory? I'm inclined to think that probably not because the sad yeah. part about that, if you, if, you, if you visualize something, you tend to think that that's all there is. Yeah. And that's finite. That, that's the infinite one is not 
finite. In fact, you said only I, Jesus said. Yeah, and so yeah, it's... People it, are there, they recognize the presence of the Father, but Jim and I talking today, that's one of the things that came up, yeah. real interesting. Yeah. I think yeah. it's talking about the character of God, and as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we behold the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, eyes, nose, mouth. Mm -hmm. yeah. that Character, sort of thing. I think, that, I think that's key. That's key yeah. to the, that's So when the angels word. do behold the face of the Father, I think it's talking about how his character, there's no resistance in their Perfect hearts love. for mm -hmm. between love. what his will is, the will of the Father, and and uh, unfallen beings. Uh, for yeah. us, though, we would resist. You know, yeah. we've already talked about, are there difficult passages, things here that we just don't want to listen to? Well, that just shows the condition of our fallen wills uh, and perverted and distorted. Another problem is that there are people sometimes saying they are going to spend a certain period of time living as the Bible teaches. Uh, there's people who've written whole books about trying, to, for one year, they're going to live like the Bible teaches. Literally, uh, taking it like that, without taking into consideration the context and the reasons why things happened as they did. This can lead to such a distorted picture that it makes the Bible look silly. So what is the problem? Well, first of all, you need to understand clearly what the Bible said, Ideally, you would know Koine Greek, Ancient Hebrew, and Aramaic, and you should know then know them well enough so that you understand the subtle implications often found in sentences. In other words, what are we saying? If you want to understand and you really want to present it like that, you need to know fully the context. context okay. Why did it happen like that? There are reasons why it happened like that. Well, different churches and different denominations exist, even though they all claim to live by the Bible. This demonstrates that some form of interpretation is taking place in all of us. There are some who will, who will take a single verse or even a few words and read into those few words what they want to believe. There is a fancy Greek word for that called eisegesis, which means you put yourself into what you're reading. It is very much frowned upon by careful Bible scholars. What we need to do is to try to discover what the Bible originally intended by a given passage and accept that through a process called exegesis. In other words, you get the meaning out of the scripture and you then apply it to yourself. How about also read the Old Testament from the paradigm uh, that Jesus taught mm -hmm. rather than trying to impose Take, take the Old Testament and overlay the, the New Testament. No, go, do it the other way. Because if, if the Old Testament, what we have of, of the Old Testament, was correct, the message was correct, Jesus wouldn't have ne needed to come. It, Jesus had to come to correct the, the misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And, of course, then in Matthew 23, he says, oh, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Mm -hmm. uh, seven times he said that. So mm -hmm. that must have, must have been important. Well, the Old Testament said he had to come to die. Jesus interpreted it. That's what he told them on the way to Emmaus, that uh, all the things, these things had to take place when they said we thought it was him, um, and yet he's, he's dead. He opened the scriptures to them and showed them that all these things must take place. Yeah. Wow. Well, all of us have a worldview or a paradigm, it's sometimes called, into which we try to fit all the realities that we recognize around us. If we keep an open mind and spend sufficient time in reading the Bible, praying and in witnessing to others, which, what does the witnessing do for us? It reinforces our faith. It you, you can't teach somebody else until you got it pretty clearly in mind yourself, and you'll probably get it even straighter in mind as you try to explain it to those other people. We ought to be doing more and more and more of that. Then our worldview would grow and develop. So what happens when a person is converted? This will often, when you think about Paul on the road to Damascus, what happened to him? I call it a fruit basket upset. <laughs> yeah, he had knocked his 
he got knocked off his horse. His pretty direct whole, confrontation, wasn't it? His whole life changed. Everything changed. Yep. So this is almost certainly what happened to Paul after his experience on the Damascus Road. Later, he went into the Arabian Desert for a period of time in order to try to understand all of what's going on there. Don't we think that was around three years? Well, the whole, the total, we're going to read about that in a moment. Uh, the total is three years. We don't know how much of that time was in Damascus because he preached for a while in Damascus and then they wanted to kill him, to arrest him. So he went to Arabia for a period of time and then he came back to Damascus again, taught for a little while, and this time they had to let him down on a basket over the edge yeah. so he could escape. So we don't know how much Damascus time there was on both ends of that three years. But That's it was some... So many years before he actually got back to Jerusalem, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, the, yeah, no, the, the three years is when he got back to Jerusalem. So it took three years before he was brought in to Jerusalem. And I, the, I, I, the can, brethren. Yeah, I, I, I just want every time I read that story, I think, what, what did his wife think? What did he try to communicate with her? If so, how? We don't know anything about that. We'll what did the, the Sanhedrin? the story someday. But... What, what did the, the soldiers who were with, with him, he, he took a bunch of people, I don't know exactly where they were, Roman soldiers, probably Jewish soldiers, that went with him. They were supposed to be arresting these Christians and taking them back to Jerusalem. So finally, when they realized Paul had gone off, they must have gone back. What did they say to the Sanhedrin when they got back there? You won't believe what happened? Something like that. <laughs> they probably never forgot it. Yeah, I'm they sure. They were there, I mean, when that happened. Okay. So what do we know about all that? Galatians 2, 16b, the last part, to yep. chapter to 19. Okay, Paul says, I did not go to anyone for advice, nor did I go to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. Instead, I went at once to Arabia, and then I returned to Damascus. It was three years later that I went to Jerusalem to obtain information from Peter, and I stayed with him for two weeks. I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. And this is from the Good News Bible. Okay, so two weeks. Here's Paul, the former persecutor and killer of Christians, and he shows up at Peter's house. We learn from other sources that they didn't want, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. But Barnabas finally said, no, this, yeah. is, this guy is genuine. Took him to Peter. What do you suppose Peter and Paul had to say to each other during those two weeks? Well, I think Paul probably got a lot of information from Peter about his time yeah. with Jesus and what it was like. He probably had to hear that over and over. Yeah. And I think Paul would have I think Paul his mind overwhelmed probably most of the disciples. Yeah. Anybody that he met. Well Yeah, he might have had a lot to say to Peter. Peter would well, ask I mean, him a lot of questions. Look look at look at we've got one of the people who he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Think about it. The top of the Pharisee, Thomas. one of the top level Pharisee people. And normally he wouldn't even have, he wouldn't have even looked the other way at Peter. Peter was a humble fisherman. He wouldn't have had anything to do with him. So here you have the humble fisherman, and here's Paul, and there, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things. I, I want to see that, that conversation in living mm -hmm. color yeah, when I be, get to yeah. heaven. That would be so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, think about the impact that the encounter with Jesus on that walk to Emmaus had on those two disciples. And later on, the rest of the disciples, as they explained to them what had happened, how difficult was it for the people who had been following Jesus to give up their idea that he would become the Messiah they wanted to help them conquer the Romans. Try to imagine yourself sitting among the disciples as they struggle with this incredible change in outcomes from what they expected to what actually happened. Wow. Well, having talked about the issues of translation, interpretation, and hermeneutics, we need to conclude by talking about different translations or versions of the Bible. A very literal word-for-word -word translation is almost impossible to understand. 
For one thing, the Hebrews wrote from right to left, while we write from left, we write from left to right. But some attempts at a formal translation make excellent study Bibles. Examples of such Bibles might be the New Revised Standard Version. I'm just picking some ones that I'm fairly familiar with. The New American Standard Bible, 1995 Revision, and the New King James Bot Version. Other, and others that are similar. If you took one of these translations and translated it back into Hebrew, assuming that you had the ability and the skill to do that, you might come up with something close to what the original Hebrew said. But there are also a dynamic translations. What do we mean by a dynamic translation? They, instead of translating, trying to translate word for word, they try to get the whole meaning of the sentence, and then they try to say it in a language which would be our common language for today. So it's a meaning for meaning translation instead of a word for word equivalent. And those, the translation is restructured into idiomatic usage, representing the equivalent thought or meaning in our language. These are much easier to follow and understand. For many people, of course, how reliable that version is depends on the translators. There are times when, despite their best efforts, the results clearly do not match what we believe the original text said. So, are there any perfect translations? No. No, <laughs> there aren't. I can just tell you there are none. I, I did a, a, a master's thesis on a really tiny little issue in the New Testament called the conjectural emendations in the Greek New Testament. And its translations are all over the board, even the King James, on how they deal with Places where the, the, the original language doesn't seem to be right. It looks like someone made a mistake. And there's another word that would make it seem right, but it's not quite the same as the word that's there. And so you say, well, maybe someone made a mistake when they copied it or they heard it. They heard someone speaking it and they were writing it down. So for like this, these are, those are conjectural emendations. And uh, there's a lot of them more than 60 in the Bible. That words that, what we call scholarly guess changes, conjectural emendations, that's what I mind. So, translators have to do their best. There are times when, despite their best efforts, the results clearly do not match what we believe the original, what we may believe what the original said. Then there are paraphrases. What's a paraphrase? Basically, using your own words to get the meaning of a text, mm. basically putting try, into your own to, or somebody you, trying yeah, to put try it Try to read a whole paragraph, yeah. for example, and yeah. then try to say it in modern language. These are best used when we want to read a large portion of Scripture to get a general idea of what it's talking about. They are also good for those who just want to read through the Bible over a period of time. For serious Bible students, it would be ideal to have one of the more literal translations available and alongside it, perhaps one of the more dynamic translations, such as the Good News Bible. So if you're reading one, it's excellent to have, if you have one that's more liberal, more general, closer to the paraphrase kind of idea, it's a good idea to have one of the more word-for-word -word kind of ones standard. So I, I, have the, I have four or five of them on my Bible, my computer right here. So if I see something there that doesn't seem to fit, boom. Push another translation, it immediately goes to the right spot in the new translation. I can see, well, oh yeah. In fact, I can do the same with the Bible languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. So, if you're interested in reading fairly quickly through a portion of Scripture to get a general idea, a paraphrase is excellent, such as the Message Bible or the Living Bible. <coughs> so, how much influence should we attribute to the culture in which the biblical writers were writing? The biblical writers insist that the theological message of Scripture is not culture-bound, applicable for only certain people and a certain time, but permanent and universally applicable. Richard Davidson, Biblical Interpretation in the Handbook of SDA Theology. Rel, Deteran, and so forth. Yeah, if we spend our time focusing on how different the cultures were in Bible times from our own culture today, it might seem like this is too big a gap. But God knows how to communicate over time. And he offers us the Holy Spirit to guide us. But God forbid that we allow blindness of heart to influence our understanding of Scripture. 
What's blindness of heart? None are so blind as those that will not see or so deaf as they will not hear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you're if you're sure, I mean, think about the disciples. I, you know, I feel sorry for them once in a while. I think about this. I mean, we're going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus, the one who's been leading us for these years, last several years, he's going to be chosen king. Yeah. Imagine. Well, look at Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. In the Lord's name, then I warn you, do not continue to live like the heathen, whose thoughts are worthless, and whose minds are in the dark. Do we have that problem? They have no part in the life that God gives, for they are completely ignorant and stubborn. Stubborn, Even after one has done his or her very best to try to understand Scripture, there might be times when a disaster hits a family or some other problem arises and our faith is shaken. How can we avoid letting our faith be shaken under such circumstances? It might seem like there are a lot of pitfalls in coming to understand and know the Bible. But if one belongs to a group or f of fellow believers who can help you understand when you have, what you've read, it's a great aid. So, I'll ask you all here. Have you found a translation with which you are comfortable? I think you all mm -hmm. have figured out by now that I'm very comfortable with the Good News Bible. And I love the Holman translation yeah. of the Bible. Yeah. Well, that's a revised standard version that's, that uses it. The Holman. But it, yeah, the Holman. It's, it's a... Like I like the New American Standard. Yeah, New American Standard. I like that one. That's one of my probably my second choice. When I go from the Good News and I think, mm, is that really what it says? And I, then I jump over to the, the Good News. I mean the uh, New American Standard. Of course, my New American Standard has the New American Standard, and then it has the Hebrew or the Greek, depending what part of the Bible you're in, or Aramaic, the part of the Bible. And then, if if necessary, I can put, just click on the word, and it'll take me to the to the uh, Concordance that tells me exactly what that word means. So I read two every morning because I read it in King James and then I go to the good news. Mm -hmm. And the good news is really good news <laughs> because you can just understand everything yeah. that it's saying so readily. Okay, well, we're running out of time. Have you found a translation? We've already talked about that. Do you have other translations available for times when you want just to read or perhaps want a more dynamic equivalent? When I when I want to see a more dynamic equivalent, I like to go to the Message Bible. Now, that doesn't mean it's the only one, but that's another one that you would really enjoy reading if you have time. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to come together and talk like this, to, to, to accept your guidance in our, in our thinking together. We thank you for this opportunity we have to share what we believe and see on this program. We ask that all those out there who are listening in and watching will be blessed. May your Holy Spirit be close to each one of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.